worship together.
gonna stay still Verses 16, uh, 15 and 16. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus did that. He ate with common people, with sinners. Um, the Pharisees obviously thought they were much better. But Jesus ate with common folk. It was true. He ate with sinners. And it was never truer than at the Last Supper when he ate with his 12 apostles. If you look at them, you'll see what kind of people they were. Peter betrayed him. Jesus had to tell him, get behind me, Satan. Put away your sword, Peter. John and, and James, the hot-tempered brothers, the sons of thunder, their pride made them want to be first. Matthew, the traitorous tax collector, Simon, the militant, the revolutionary, and of course Judas, he always had the money bag with him. He would take out of the money bag and ultimately betray Jesus. When we gather around this table, it reminds us that we're sinners. 1 John 1.8 says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But when we, when we come to this table, it also reminds us that if we fail to see ourselves as sinners, we err. We need a Savior. And 1 John 2 says, if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Whenever we partake, we celebrate the fact that Jesus still eats with sinners. Let's pray. And thank you, Heavenly Father for coming to our defense and going to the cross for us and taking our punishment for our sins. And we thank you, Lord, that you would come down to this earth and eat with sinners like us. And as we partake of these emblems, may we remember your sacrifice for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And you have emblems in front of you. If you'd open them, we'll partake together.
We do this in remembrance of Jesus. come to offering time and we always want to remember the Lord for how he's blessed us let's pray dear Heavenly Father we thank you once again for how much you bless us Lord you are so good to us and we want to honor you Lord with our tithes and offerings we ask Lord that you just bless this money and just help it to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. And there is a box in the back. We have a new box, and it's mounted on the wall if you'd like to drop your, your offerings in there. And we also today have a, a video, uh, I believe it's from Ives, <coughs> one of our missionaries. Um, we're getting ready for Faith Promise next week, so... Here's a video. Hello, my name is Justin, and I am the director of church relations at IVES. IVES stands for International Disaster Emergency Service and was created back in 1973 as a disaster relief organization for the Christian churches and churches of Christ. As a mission, IVES provides a way for our churches to pull their financial resources together with other churches and individual donors where the funds can be used effectively for disaster response, medical care, community development, and hunger relief, which is all centered around evangelism. IHS works with mission partners around the world in the aftermath of floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis, typhoons, fire, earthquakes, volcanoes, drought, and other natural disasters along with man-made disasters like civil wars that create the flight of refugees. And we can officially add a worldwide pandemic to that list. We reach out to our mission partners to show the love of Jesus by providing clean water, medical supplies, shelter, food, repairing homes, building storage sheds, and aiding communities in their recovery efforts. Our mission is to share help and hope to the world, to introduce as many people as possible to our Lord and Savior. The stories of God's grace and goodness continue to unfold during the COVID-19 pandemic. We are hearing stories of faith and courage, of love and hope, and how his faithful followers are making an impact on our world for Christ. Some of our mission partners are even getting to work with governments that were once close to them. At the end of 2020, IDES has surpassed $1 million given to our mission partners and churches on the front line of COVID-19 crisis. We have joined our mission partners with nine countries and in eight states. And with no end in sight, the list is sure to grow. In 2020, our disaster response team and volunteers have been responding to relief efforts in many places in the U.S. and abroad. We sent aid to our mission partners in the Philippines after a volcano erupted. We were on the ground in the Bahamas in February, continuing to help in the restoration of homes after last year's hurricane. We helped in Tennessee after tornadoes ripped through several towns near Nashville. In central Michigan, we built storage sheds with our volunteers after a massive flooding. In August, our team went into Iowa to assist Antioch Christian Church with a cleanup from the massive storm that passed through their county. This past fall, we worked with South City Christian Church in Lake Charles, Louisiana, with the recovery efforts for not one, but two hurricanes, Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Delta. We also sent aid to churches helping the displaced in California and Oregon due to the horrific forest fires in 
worked in Pensacola, Florida after Hurricane Sally. God has blessed Hines for such a time as this. And with the support of churches like Christian Church of De Leon Springs, more will continue to be done. Since 1973, Ides has now worked with our mission partners in 127 nations. Your partnership with us continues to allow us to share the love of Jesus to those in need all around the world. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John 3, 18. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with action and in truth. And on behalf of Ides, I want to thank you for doing just that, putting your love into action. For more up-to-date information, please visit our website at ides.org. Thank you, and may God bless you in the coming year. Hope you enjoyed that personal message from Ides to our church. And please remember that when you support missions, it's really making a difference. When you <coughs> give to Faith Promise, it's impacting people, not just in our country or our community, but around the world. And uh, before we start talking about Faith Promise, we want to remind you that on Friday night, we uh, were feeding the hungry here at our church. We had 42 individuals that were fed, and we really uh, appreciate uh, those who came out to serve. We had 15 people who were serving food and getting things ready. And I want to say thank you to Linda Whitener and the Benevolence Ministry for all their hard work. You can give a round of applause. We fed 42 people in the rain. Not like literally fed them, but we were able to give them meals. And uh, next time we hope to see more people come out. Hopefully we'll have a little bit better weather. But it was a great time to bring our people together to meet a need in the community. Please remember that a week from Tuesday, small groups will begin. That is January 26th. So if you're planning to attend a group on Tuesday morning or Tuesday night, Wednesday night, or Thursday night, those will begin next week. So jump into those small groups. And next Sunday will be our first Sunday of Faith Promise. Larry Lewis will be speaking on uh, the 24th, and David Peters will be speaking on the 31st. Our theme is still unstoppable. We, be we believe that God is still unstoppable. Our goal is $35,000. We would love to exceed that goal. And please remember, over these last few weeks of January, this is the, the, the final weeks of Faith Promise, and uh, we pray that we would finish strong. We thank you for your generous support. Ides thank you. Ides thanks you. All of our missionaries thank you. You're going to be hearing more from other missionaries as this month goes on. So uh, be excited about what God is doing in your life, in our church, and around the world. That's, uh, there's a lot going on, and we pray that God blesses all that we're doing. So we're getting into John chapter 2 this week, John chapter 2. And uh, you'll see that it's the story of the wedding at Cana in Galilee. John chapter 2, Jesus attends a wedding. So I thought it would be good for us to talk about when things go wrong at weddings, wedding fails, wedding misfortunes, I don't know what you want to call them. Sometimes it's a simple thing like a cake falling off of a table, Maybe the bride faints. You know what? It's a great idea to have a beach wedding until you lose the wedding rings in the sand. That's not very uh, pleasant. What about when the whole bridal party or wedding party is standing on a dock to take a nice picture and the dock collapses, drops everybody into the water? Uh, there's, a, there's some new trends going on. Those beach weddings, those are a new trend. A lot more beach weddings going on these days. And a beach wedding is nice. It's nice and beautiful until a seagull comes along and drops a dead fish on your mother-in-law. That actually happened to one couple. Also, people are starting to get married at farms and in barns, and uh, that sounds like a good idea until in the background you can hear a cow giving birth. That, that happened at one wedding. And I'll let you decide which one of these fails uh, you like better, either the father or the uh, mother-in-law of the bride. The dad was in charge of catering. His kids gave him $500 to cater the wedding. So he kept $300 for himself and spent $200 on food. And the food that he bought to cater the wedding was, guess what? Hot dogs. Hot dogs for a wedding. Or we have the mother-in-law, and there's actually a picture of it on the screen, who decided to wear a wedding dress to, her, to the wedding. Yeah, so I don't know which one is worse. Here we are in John chapter 2 where Jesus is going to attend a wedding and something is going to go wrong. 
Something is going to go wrong in John chapter 2. It's also the opportunity for Jesus' first miracle. So let's get into John chapter 2, read it together, and hopefully learn a lot from this story that's only found in the Gospel of John. This miracle is only found in the Gospel of John. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Now, there are so many details in every verse of Scripture. When we look at the first verse, John chapter 2, verse 1, it says, On the third day. So this means it's about three days after Jesus <laughs> called Philip and Nathaniel at the end of chapter 1. So all of these things are taking place in the same week. Jesus is at the wedding at Cana, and it's just a few days after he has called Peter, Andrew, John, Philip, and Nathaniel. These events are happening one right after another. And uh, what is the event that brings them together here in John chapter 2? What, what are they attending? A wedding. a wedding. They're attending a wedding. Now, when we go to a wedding, you usually go to a wedding, then you go to a go to the reception, and then you leave. In biblical, time, biblical times, in New Testament times, a wedding feast, which we would call a, oh, I just lost the word, reception, we go to a reception, it lasts just a few hours, hopefully, right? <laughs> but in those days, a wedding feast would last for a week. Seven days. Seven days where you need to provide food and drink for everybody who's been invited to the wedding. And what's interesting is that in those times, it wasn't the bride's responsibility to pay for it. It was the groom's responsibility to pay for it. So it was a little different. And the wine ran out. The wine ran out. There was no more wine. They ran out of wine. And uh, they can't run to Walmart and go buy more wine. Can't do that. We're kind of spoiled in our country. And to run out of wine would be a shameful thing. There would be a stigma on this family, kind of like when you buy hot dogs for the reception. <laughs> And uh, the bride's family could actually be uh, sued for this. The bride's family could actually be sued by the groom's family, or the groom's family could be sued by the bride's family for running out of wine. And some people think, well, if Jesus showed up with Peter, Andrew, John, Philip, Nathaniel, if he showed up with all these extra guys, maybe they caused the, w the wine shortage. Well, if Jesus was part of the problem, he's definitely going to be the solution. He's going to solve the problem for them. And also at the wedding, we see that Jesus' mother was there, but John doesn't mention her by name. Her name is not mentioned. John figures, you've read the other Gospels, you should know her name by now. Her name is obviously Mary. But not only does he not mention Mary by name, he doesn't mention the disciples by name. He doesn't even mention the name of the bride and groom. The only name he wants us to focus on is the name of Jesus. He wants us to focus on Jesus. And Mary says they have no wine. Jesus. Joseph had died. If Joseph had died at this point, because we never see him in the story after this, if Joseph has died, then Mary and the family are relying on Jesus anyway. He's the one who would be providing for them. As a carpenter, he would be working and building things and selling things to provide for his family. He's the head of the household now. He's the patriarch. He's the provider. They would be re relying on him and leaning on him. But you'll notice that Mary is worried about this wedding that's taking place right there at that moment. She's worried about the wine at the wedding. And what we need to remember as we go through the Gospel of John is that we should not get fixated on the earthly story, the lower story that's taking place in the Gospel of John. We need to pay attention to what God is doing in the heavenly story, in the upper story in the Gospel of John. They had a problem that there was no wine, but there's a greater lesson to be learned from John chapter 2, from the wedding at Cana. So let's read on a little bit. John chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. John 2, verses 4 and 5. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother, said to the, his mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now, Jesus did not call her mother. He didn't call her mom. He didn't call her Mary. I think it's weird when kids call their parents by their first names. I really don't like that. But he didn't call her Mary. He didn't call her mom. Didn't call her mother. What did he call her? Woman. 
woman. Now, that might seem strange to you, but he calls her this again when he's on the cross. He says, woman, behold your son, when he gives her over to John the Apostle, as John the Apostle would care for her. So it must be something that Jesus called her on a regular basis, because we see it in John chapter 2, and then in John chapter 19. But at this point in his life, Jesus has been baptized. He's beginning his ministry. He's calling these disciples to follow him. And uh, there's a change taking place. No longer is he Mary's little boy. He's no longer growing up in Mary's household. Mary's role is changing as well. Mary is no longer, she's still his mother. She's still the mother of Jesus. But now she has to realize that she's a follower of Jesus. She is to follow this, this child, this man that she has uh, given birth to. And Jesus' mission is going to be determined not by his earthly mother, but by his heavenly father. So he calls her woman. He uses that term at other times. But it's also interesting that Jesus says to her, Woman, my hour has not yet come. And you're going to see this throughout the Gospel of John. As you go through the Gospel of John, you'll see it in John chapter 7 and in John chapter 8 where Jesus says, My hour has not yet come. And he means the final hour when he will go to the cross and die for our sins. He's not ready to do that yet in John chapter 2. There's other things that still have to take place. There's a ministry that needs to occur in Jesus' life. And remember, don't get focused on the lower story. Stay focused on the upper story. That's the struggle that we're going to see in the Gospel of John, struggling with physical, earthly, lower things when we should be focused on heavenly things. We should be focused on that upper story. So Jesus spoke to his mother, and then his mother told the servants in verse 5, do whatever he tells you, which is great advice from Mary. If Jesus said to do it, what should you do? You should do it. If Jesus says do it, you should do it. If the Bible says to do it, you should do it. And I think this is a, a great verse that kind of supports that. They are words from Jesus in Luke 17, verse 10, where it says, So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Jesus said, When you've done what you were supposed to do, when you've served, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. We're unworthy servants. We're just doing our duty. <laughs> You know, police officers and firefighters, EMTs and the military, they're doing their duty. You know, we think it's a great sacrifice, and it is, but they're just doing their job. And Jesus says, when you're a Christian, you know what your job is to do? To serve. To serve. So when we serve, we shouldn't say, hey, look at me, I've done a great thing. You know, we, we fed hungry people, or we give away backpacks, or we clean the church, or however we might be serving. You know, don't expect a medal. Don't expect a pat on the back. Jesus says, that's what you're supposed to do. We are unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. Mary told them, do what Jesus tells you to do. And that's a good reminder for us to do what Jesus tells us to do. Let's move on to verse 6. John 2, verse 6. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them to the, up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. How many jars are there, everybody? Six jars. And they hold 20 to 30 gallons. So if you do the math, you're talking, I had to look, sorry, 120 to 180 gallons. That's a lot of water. That's several bathtubs. Your bathtub holds about 40 gallons, okay? Just to put that in perspective. We're talking about six large jars, 20 to 30 gallons each, 120 to 180 gallons total, and they filled them up about halfway. Is that right? No, they filled them up to the brim. They filled them up to the brim. They filled them up to the top. That's what kids do whenever they get a glass. They fill it up to the very top. They fill it up to the brim. Have you ever overbrimmed where you fill up your cup and it's like actually hovering above the brim of the cup and somehow it doesn't spill? They filled these jars to the brim. And uh, that should be our obedience when it comes to Jesus Christ. We want to obey to the top. We want to obey to the brim. We want to obey to the fullest. Not just a little bit, not just halfway, but to the brim. And that's what they did. Jesus called that going the extra mile, right? Matthew 5, 41. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. 
And you always notice when somebody goes the extra mile, don't you? Go to a place, go to a, go to Chick-fil-A. You'll see people going the extra mile. Go to a store like Publix, people going the extra mile. There are certain companies and businesses where people go the extra mile, and there are other businesses where they don't go two feet, right? <laughs> and you know the difference. Jesus says that we should go the extra mile. These servants filled the jars up to the brim. Now, Jesus didn't touch the jars. Jesus didn't move the jars. Jesus didn't fill the jars. This is going to be a hands-free miracle, a hands-free miracle over creation. And you'll notice that the problem is that they don't have any wine. And Jesus said, fill the jars with water. Jesus gave a command first, and the blessing will come second. Jesus gave a command first, and then the blessing will come second. Jesus said, fill the jars with water, and what's he going to do? He's going to turn water into wine. Fill the jars with water. There's the command. The blessing comes second. The water will be turned to wine. In John chapter 4, verse 50, an official, son, an official comes to Jesus, and his son is sick. And Jesus doesn't go with him. In John 4, 50, Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. So the man goes home. It's a long journey to get home. And when he gets home, he finds out that his son, when did he get healed? And they tell him what time, and he said, that's the exact moment when I was talking to Jesus. But he was given the command, go home. And then he received the blessing. In John chapter 9, Jesus meets a man born blind. And Jesus doesn't heal him. He says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Here's your command, go wash in the pool. And the man washed in the pool, and what happened to his blindness? He was healed, he could see. The command comes first, then the blessing. The very last chapter of John, John chapter 21, the disciples are in the boat. Peter and the other disciples go fishing. They don't catch any fish. This is after the resurrection, actually. And Jesus says, cast the net on the right side of the boat. There's the command. They cast the net, and they went from zero fish to 153 fish. First the command, then the blessing. John chapter 11, when Lazarus is dead, Jesus told them, take away the stone. Martha said, but Lord... There's a bad odor. He's been in there for four days. But Jesus said, take away the stone. Then he said, Lazarus, come out. And he came out and he was alive. The command came first, then the blessing. That's the way it works in the Gospel of John. Our problem is we want the blessing before we obey the command. We want the blessing before we obey the command. Mary told those servants, do whatever he tells you. We should listen to her advice. Do what Jesus commands you first, and then expect the blessing later. Don't expect it the other way around. Don't expect the blessing before the command. Verses 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. I'm thankful for what Bob Evers read during um, his communion meditation. Those verses about Jesus is a friend of sinners. This man eats with tax collectors and sinners. Did, did you ever realize that Jesus kind of had a bad reputation? He had a reputation as a party animal. He really did. In Luke 7, 34, Jesus was talking about himself, and he's just reporting what people were saying about him. Luke 7, 34, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. The religious leaders looked at Jesus, and they said, man, he's a party boy. You know, he goes to a wedding, and, you know, he creates hundreds of gallons of wine, and he hangs out with the tax collectors and sinners He's a glutton and a drunkard. See, the religious leaders thought, if we call Jesus a friend of sinners, that's a put-down. Jesus said, I'll take it as a compliment because those are the people that really needed him. And that's a good reminder for us that our church is not just for people who are found and fixed. We're still here for people who are lost and broken. 
You know, if you were accepted into this church or any church when you were lost and broken, then we need to do that same thing. We need to keep doing that. We need to be here for lost and broken people. Jesus was called a friend of sinners. What a compliment for us. What a compliment for our church. Now, we don't know when the water turned into wine. It doesn't, we don't really catch on in the text. But when the master of the feast tasted it, he said, man, this is the best wine we've had all week. Right? I mean, a lot of people like to think, you know, they have drunk freely. Well, how much did they drink? But we really need to look at the quality. He said, the master of the banquet said, you have kept the good wine until now. He says, this is the best we've had all week. When God gives to us, he always gives us his best, right? Yeah. He never gives less than his best. And when it's time for our, it's time for us to give, whether we're giving service or giving money or giving help, giving encouragement, we're supposed to give our best in return. God wants us to give our best in return. I give you my best, you give me your best. And that's a biblical concept. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. You do your best. Don't just do good enough. You know, you wouldn't give good enough to your boss. You shouldn't give good enough to your teacher. So why would God receive what's good enough? You give him your best. Whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your might. There's a church that used to say, if, if we display his name, it deserves our best. If we use the name Christian, that's Jesus' name. That's not our name. If we display the name of Jesus, it deserves our best. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Jesus created the best wine up until that point. The be he saved the best. He created the best. Verses 11 and 12. Let's finish up the story. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. His disciples believed in him. His disciples believed in him, and then we see that his mother, Mary, and his brothers, they all go with him. The disciples believed in him, Mary believed in him, but his brothers did not. Jesus' brothers did not believe in him. We can read about that. Uh, you'll read about that uh, later on as we get through the Gospels. I think it's in John chapter 7. It says they just didn't believe in him. You know, They couldn't believe that their mother, their brother, that their mother gave birth to the Messiah and that their older brother actually was the Messiah. So the disciples believed, but the brothers did not. The brothers did not believe yet, but they will. They will. They will believe. But what's great about this story is it's taking place at what kind of event? A wedding. It's a wedding. And uh, that's kind of a theme across the Bible. Weddings, banquets, suppers, dinners, party. It's a party. And we see this in Revelation 19, one of the last images that we see in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 7 through 9, is that when we get to heaven, it's going to be a banquet. It's going to be a party. <laughs> We don't really care for the term banquet a whole lot, right? You know, that sounds kind of formal and stuffy. You know, if I said to you, I'm inviting you to a banquet at my house, you'd be like, oh, that sounds boring. But if I said, I'm having a party, you'd be like, yeah, I'm on board for a party. Well, that's Revelation 19. There's going to be a party in heaven. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. That's what we have to look forward to. We're looking forward to a wedding where it's Jesus and his people, Jesus and his church. And we are his bride, Jesus and his church. When it talks about the bride, that's us. We need to remember, there's basically four things you need to remember from this Revelation 19 passage. Number one is that we are the bride. We are the bride. Jesus loves the church. Jesus loves his bride. That's us. We are all part of the bride of Christ. Men, women, and children, we are all part of the bride of Christ. And that's what we read in Ephesians 5.25. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her because we are his bride. He died for everybody. He died for us. We are his bride. The second thing that we need to realize from that passage is that we are clothed by God. We are clothed by God. Those who were at the, the wedding of the Lamb in Revelation 19 were given fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. They were clothed by God. There's no tuxedo rentals. There's no buying wedding dresses. You're clothed by God. And this is a concept we talk about frequently in our church services. Galatians 3.27 says, For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. We're all clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We're clothed in the holiness of Jesus Christ. We don't get there on our own. It's all through Jesus. We are clothed by God. The third thing, we are invited and inviting. Blessed are those who are invited. Who's invited? Everybody's invited. When God throws a party, everybody's invited. In Matthew 22, verse 2, Jesus tells a parable of the kingdom of a, of, well, I'll just read it to you. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. So Jesus brings it up in his parables as well. And uh, the king is throwing the wedding banquet. The king is throwing a party. The invited guests refused to come. They paid no attention. They were doing their own thing. So the king told his servants, so go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. That's what we've been talking about for the year 2021. As Jesus was sent into the world, he's sending us into the world as the Father has sent me. I am sending you. What the king told his servants is what we're supposed to do. Go, invite, and find them. Go find them, go to them, find them, and invite them. <clears throat> invite them to the banquet. Invite them to the party. Invite them to the kingdom of God. And the last thing is that we will feast in the presence of Jesus. We will feast in the presence of Jesus. We are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. We are, inviting to the, we are invited to the wedding supper of Jesus and his church. Please remember that the kingdom of God is a wedding, not a funeral. The kingdom is a wedding, not a funeral. Even think about the prodigal son when he came home. When the prodigal son came home, what did the father do? The father in the parable represents God. The father said, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Let's have a feast and celebrate. That's what the father said in Luke 15. And that's what God is saying. God's saying, I'm preparing a feast. I'm preparing a wedding banquet. And everybody's invited. And if you've accepted the invitation, if you've responded to Jesus Christ, that's great. Now we need to do our part to invite other people to join us in the wedding feast. That's what it's all about. It's all about responding to the kingdom of God, and it's about responding to Jesus Christ. And if you need to respond to Jesus Christ, if you need to be clothed with Christ in baptism because you believe that he's your Lord and Savior, we would encourage you to make that decision as we stand and sing this song, Waymaker. We're going to stand and sing it together. Touching every heart, I worship you. 
never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. church and then he came a few times to lead worship and uh, after a few times of leading worship he brought a friend with him and his friend's name was Sammy and they went from dating to engagement they got married last year and uh, now we're excited to announce that Will and Sammy are going from two to three uh, yeah. so congratulations to Will and Sammy they'll be giving birth in July all right so so get ready for a, not a wedding feast, but a, a baby shower, right? So we're going to celebrate the birth of their first child. We're looking forward to that. Keep them in your prayers. And uh, it's always great when God blesses us with uh, new life. So, you know, we pray for Will and Sammy and their families and get to rejoice with them. So let's uh, bow in prayer before we leave. Dear Lord God, we thank you that we can be here today. And we thank you for uh, the wonderful gift of life that you give to to husbands and wives, but the gift that you give us every single day. And uh, we thank you that there's a greater life ahead of us, the eternal life that we have with you, and we'll celebrate together, we'll feast together. Lord, we thank you that you are the God who wants to celebrate when people turn back to you, and we want to share in those times of celebration, Lord. We want to see people turn back to you. That's our prayer in Jesus' name.